Uh, this will be very familiar to some of you, newer to some of you. So we're, I think we'll pick this up though this morning and talk about the kingdom of God. And uh, we're going to uh, cover today what I'm calling part one, geography. Okay, so uh, if you talk about a kingdom, if you talk about Nairobi, uh, for example, you might, it's not necessarily a kingdom, but the uh, chief city of a kingdom, you might want to say, well, where's that at? So we mean locationally, where is Nairobi? And if you say, well, Kenya, you want to say, well, where's Kenya at? And so we uh, uh, are interested in the geography of things. And so I'm saying there is a geography to the kingdom of God according to the scriptures. And we want to take a look at that uh, today. This is not just a matter of theological interest, if I can use the term that way. It, it's really a matter of concern or interest to us as people, as Christians, as believers. And uh, I think that uh, we would want to know about this issue because it has to do with our future. And it has to do with our future hope, our hope. And so I think uh, uh, there are things here we'd like to know a lot about. We can't cover it all really in one session. Today we're going to talk about geography. And then next time perhaps we'll, we'll talk further about some other things. But uh, we're asking the question here, where will we be? Will we be where the kingdom of God is? We, that's where we're going to be. Uh, but where is that? Uh, we might want to be where Jesus is at. I think that's a good thought. But uh, the question is, uh, where will he be? Where is that going to happen? So uh, he is the king of the kingdom. So I would think if I'm going to be in the kingdom of God, I'm going to be where he's at. Uh, so, uh, a, a quick answer by many, many people is to sort of uh, just simply say, well, it's all in heaven, but we'll take a look at that today and kind of challenge that question. I don't think that's the best answer, and you can decide for yourselves, but, uh, but I just don't think that's it. And remember, when it comes to Jesus, he is in heaven. And maybe that's why we sometimes think, well, it's all going to be in heaven. That's where Jesus is at. But remember, he's not always going to be there. Uh, the scripture that talks about him being in heaven finds Yahweh, God, speaking to him and saying to him, the risen Messiah, sit at my right hand forever. And, no, sit at my right hand till... So uh, there is a time frame on this business of how long the Messiah will sit at the right hand of God in heaven. So we want to look more at that. But we've got a lot to cover here, so let's, let's get going. The word kingdom, I think, uh, is found around 300 times in the Bible in Hebrew, Aramaic, interestingly, in Daniel uh, particularly. And then uh, Basilea in, in Greek about 150 times in your New Testament. So that's a lot of interest in this subject. General definition, synonyms would be things like a realm, a domain, a dominion, a country, empire, principality. That's interesting. Uh, a country, state, or territory ruled by a king or queen. And I'm saying here it is sort of a king's domain. The kingdom of God, then, is God's domain. And isn't that where this phrase is coming from? A king's domain. King dumb. Domain of a king. So that's, that's where, what we're kind of looking at here. Well, let's say this uh, from the very beginning. The earth, this earth, in one sense, and the whole universe, I suppose, belongs to God. He made it, so I guess it's rightfully his. It's justly his kingdom. It's his place. So, uh, uh, and then we have this statement in Psalm 50 and verse 10 that says, uh, for every wild animal of the forest is mine. Isn't that interesting? The cattle on a thousand hills, they are his. So it's already his. So we could say then, well, all the earth is God's kingdom. It's his domain. And uh, so you could look at it that way, I suppose. 
But actually, when we get into the scriptures and look at the kingdom of God, begin to take a closer look at that, then it's not just the earth in that raw sense of the word. It's not just the, the hills and the, and the dominion in that sense. Actually, the phrase kingdom of God being used in the scriptures is focused on a particular issue, a particular matter. And uh, we'll see then that the kingdom of God actually uh, deals with humanity, uh, humanity upon the earth and human beings. Uh, so we learned this in passing too, that actually God is even involved in the kingdoms of men. Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? So, uh, and we, we run into that and think about it some, but the uh, Daniel, in Daniel 4, 17, we find this, in order that all who live may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of mortals, he gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of human beings sometimes. So we might put it this way. In order to accomplish his greater purposes, God works and deals in the kingdoms of men, in the governments of men. And we find that in various ways in the Bible. Remember, we find the, the scripture talking about King Cyrus as being the Lord's, Yah, Yahweh's anointed. Isn't that interesting? Uh, because God chose him to, to be king, even though he was a, a heathen fellow, right? But God's dealing in these. We find in Romans, the 13th chapter, that these, these kingdoms and dominions of men are actually, God works in those things. So that's uh, just a thought we have in passing. But that's still not the kingdom of God that is being referenced when we look at the scriptures uh, and that phrase, right? Okay. God's unique kingdom, I'll use that term, God's kingdom actually then was still future. So the kingdoms that then were, though God worked in those things, that was not really his kingdom. The kingdom of God is seen as being a future issue to the peoples in the Old Testament. And when we get to the New Testament, Wow, everything has stepped up greatly then about the kingdom and its coming, but it's still actually future, I think. We're, we're praying, remember Jesus is saying in what we call the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, right? It's not, hey, your kingdom is already here, but thy kingdom come. So I think that's uh, still a future uh, picture that we have there. So we have this interesting thing about the future kingdom in Daniel 2.44, and of course we could spend much more time in some of these uh, various visions and so on. But uh, uh, listen to this though. And in the days of those kings, earthly kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. All of this again was future at that time. In the days of those kings, kings that he has in mind that were future, in the days of those kings, then the God of heaven's going to set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. These other kingdoms may come or go. They did come and go. But this one, once it's established, will never be destroyed. This now we're beginning to really read about the kingdom of God, right? This is tremendous. Nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. Nobody's going to take it over from God, okay? It shall crush all these earthly kingdoms, all the other kingdoms, and bring them to an end, and it shall stand, it, the kingdom that God's going to establish, will be standing forever. So again, the kingdom of God is not just the earth, even though we just read he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and the, all of these you know, the earth is really his. But that's not the kingdom that we're reading about and learning about in the scriptures. And that's, that's what we're focusing on today, right? Okay. Back to the matter of geography then. The kingdom of God has a location, a physical location, if you will. And, and I think this is interesting. 
Uh, we also pick this up in Daniel uh, and that great vision, remember with the, with the tremendous image and all of that. We've talked about these things in the past. But remember, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, these things that this great image is composed of, were all broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. So what's happening to these kingdoms of men, the kingdoms of the earth? They're, they're, they're not just sort of melting into becoming the kingdom of God. They're actually abolished, if you will. They're done away with. And the kingdom of God is being established in, in their place. So not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled where? Filled the whole earth. So we're, we're being geography uh, direct here. This is, this is a matter of something that's going to happen on the earth. It's earthly kingdoms that are going to be supplanted, destroyed really, and it is on the earth then that this kingdom that God is going to set up, which was future to them, that, on the other hand, is going to also be on the earth. So now the whole earth will be filled with this, with this kingdom, I think. So now we have a physical location that, uh, and notice this, I'm, I'm making this statement, the kingdom of God really is not in heaven. Yeah, as I said when we started today, you can decide for yourself about these things. But I think this is pretty easy. When we get to looking at it, uh, that's a popular idea. The kingdom of God is, is heaven. They're in heaven. And so we'll all go off to the kingdom of God in heaven. But we just read, didn't we, the, this amazing uh, prophecy by Daniel uh, where that the kingdom is actually going to decimate the kingdoms of this earth and then the kingdom of God is going to do what? It's going to fill the whole earth. Wow. So the phrase kingdom of heaven that kind of leads this sometimes is found I think maybe 32 times or so in the New Testament and they're all in the book of Matthew. Matthew uses that particular phrase. He likes that. Jesus used it I'm certain, but Jesus also used the phrase kingdom of God. They're, they're interchangeable, we'll see that. But notice that every time it's used, it's the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the, the Greek genitive would say from heaven possibly. So the kingdom that comes from heaven, uh, not a kingdom that's off in heaven. But the, uh, uh, and it's never said to be the kingdom in heaven. I, I think that's really an amazing uh, interesting thing. The kingdom of heaven then is of heaven or from heaven and we discover that many things come from heaven though they don't necessarily physically exist in heaven. We've studied that and understood that in relationship to the Messiah, right? And so we find that the Messiah comes from heaven. That's great. But so does the other things like Matthew 21, 25, the baptism of John then, the baptism of John. From where was it? Was it from heaven or is it of men or from men? So it's an interesting thing. So we have something from heaven, but it was never physically in heaven. To come, something to come from heaven means heaven originates it but it originates on the earth. So, you know, I, I can picture angels coming to and fro between the earth and heaven, and the, the baptism of John is coming down. And the angels say, oh, I almost got wet, look. That, you know, it's not like that, is it? The, the work that John was doing, the baptism that John was doing was from heaven, but not that it ever was literally in heaven. And of course, that's the picture with the Messiah, Jesus as well. So uh, Matthew 16 and 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. So again, you get this idea of things from heaven. So but were they picturing in their minds a sign going through some kind of intergalactic travel and coming? No, 
it means heaven causes it to come forth on the earth. It's of God, it's of heaven, but not necessarily physically in heaven. So, so it is with the kingdom of God then. The kingdom of heaven is not literally exactly in heaven, but it's brought forth upon the earth uh, by God. And, and so you could say it's from heaven or of heaven in that sense. But Jesus said, this is uh, our parallel passage, think about this. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Interesting, isn't it? Matthew 19 and verse 14. Uh, so then we have the parallel passage in Mark where it says, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven. God belongs. Mark 10 and 14. So I'm mentioning this because there are instances in which people picture, well, the kingdom of God is one thing. That's one deal. The kingdom of heaven, that's another thing. Actually, they're not. It's just phrasing that identifies the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven comes forth on the earth. The kingdom of God is that same kingdom. It's the same thing. Just two different ways of referring to the same thing. So then we find then this interesting promise in the scriptures in Psalm 37 and 29. The righteous shall inherit, and think about this for a moment, they shall inherit what? The land. They shall inherit the earth, if you will. And they shall live in it for how long? They shall live in it forever. Uh, in Psalm 37, that idea is expressed at least four times. And then uh, Jesus then picks it up in Matthew 5 and 5, and everybody knows this, but I wonder if we really understand it or really believe it. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So this is interesting. I said that uh, our, our session in this Bible study this morning is to just take a look, uh, take an honest look for ourselves and ask ourselves about our future, about our inheritance. What will that ultimately look like? And we're learning here that actually the righteous will have an inheritance, an eternal inheritance, but where will it be? We're talking about geography. They shall inherit the earth and they'll live in it for how long? Forever. It's interesting. It's in your Bible, my Bible. So it's just an interesting thing. And that's what Jesus picks up on. So it's interesting if we say Jesus is in heaven, and he is. We know that. But we learned a moment ago that he's not there permanently. He, he is to sit at the right hand of God until, until a certain point in time. So the, we, we read that in the scripture just a moment ago. Well, if, we're, if you think that in the interim of our existence, we'll be in heaven for a while, it won't be permanent. Actually, we're going to come to earth and rule and reign on the earth with Jesus for a thousand years. And uh, as, uh, as our friend Joel Hemphill uh, came to a recognition of a while back, he said, you know, we saw that he was going to reign with us and we're going to be on the earth for a thousand years. But what we didn't see was that actually that's going to continue. There's the, it doesn't just suddenly come to an end by the scriptures. It's not us then who will just suddenly leave and go away and be gone forever. But actually Jesus is going to be dwelling on the earth and God himself will come and will be present with his people like he was in the Garden of Eden. It's interesting. So, wow, let's, uh, uh, let's just think some more. So there are many Bible promises that God's people will inherit the earth. And, and I think that's very, very sure. They will dwell there forever. It seems to me that that doesn't give us much opportunity to say, well, yeah, but we're going to be somewhere else forever. Well, no, it's actually we're going to inherit the earth and we're going to dwell on the earth forever. I think that's interesting. Uh, However, there's not a statement in the Bible. Actually, I used to assume there was until I got to looking into it. And sure enough, then there's not. 
not a statement of the Bible that we would be in heaven forever. Because how can we be living in our inheritance, which is the earth, forever, if we're somewhere else forever? That wouldn't work. Uh, nor that Christ will be in heaven forever. We've got the scriptures that actually talk about him coming back to earth. Ah, just think about it. By the way, I, I'm not going to fall out over this issue. Wherever Christ is at, that's where I want to be forever. So if Christ was going to be in heaven, that would be okay with me. And I was just, I'm happy to be there with him forever. But it looks to me like the Christ, the Messiah, is actually going to reign and rule on this earth forever. So I want to be where he's at. That's, that's, my, that's my current plan. Anyway, Jesus is in heaven. We know that for real. Heaven is real and he's real and he's really in heaven. But in Acts 2, notice this that I was mentioning before. The Apostle Peter says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself, David said, The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, the Messiah, okay, sit at my right hand, but notice the next word, until, until. I'm going to make your foes your footstool. So that when that moment comes, when the time comes that that goes into motion, that all the foes of Christ are actually being made the footstool of Christ. He will be ruler over it all. That's when he no longer will reside in heaven. He's coming to earth. We've known that for a long time. We, we've recognized that. And in my background, we said, oh, we, know. we used to sing the song, Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no tempter then. When Jesus shall return to earth again. Well, that's all true. It's scriptural. And so when he's coming, he's going to set these things right upon the earth. And it's great, the scriptures, we won't get to them today, but maybe in our next session, uh, we find that we, the, the people of Christ, the people of Jesus, will rule and reign with him, what is the phrase, on the earth. Isn't that exciting? This is our future we're talking about. And uh, so I, I like this a lot. This, uh, I think it was Brother Bill, one of the first Brother Bill, <laughs> that was referencing this scripture. And I, I like it a lot. Acts 3, 19 through 21. And this is Peter again, the Apostle Peter. Notice he says, repent therefore, he's speaking to the Jews. Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah, that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus. So there's a future sending of the Messiah literally from heaven this time. He will come from heaven. And so, but Peter goes on to say, who must remain in heaven? He's in heaven at the moment. God called him up after his resurrection. He was taken up into heaven and God told him, as I said, where to sit. God said, sit at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. So, who must remain in heaven, Peter says, until the time of, this is interesting, I like the, this translation used the word universal, but the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets, I really believe that's one and the same as the establishing, the final establishing of the kingdom of God on the earth. It, as Daniel said, this rock that was a kingdom that God sent. It destroyed the kingdoms of this world, but then that rock grew and it filled the whole earth. God set up a kingdom, but the kingdom is upon this earth. So Jesus is going to be reigning over what kingdom? He's going to be reigning over a kingdom that fills the whole earth. It's going to be running, reigning over a kingdom that supplants all other kingdoms. Isn't that exciting stuff. But as I said at the beginning, this isn't just theoretical stuff or something. It's real. It's about our future. It's about our future with Jesus and uh, how, how wonderful this is. So now we wait then. They, the uh, apostle Peter was telling them in Acts the third chapter, you know, we're going to wait now, so to speak. We're waiting uh, for this one to be sent from heaven, that is Jesus, 
And when God sends him, uh, then all these, there'll be the time of that universal restoration. Now uh, we wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. So this is amazing. We're waiting now for his son to come from heaven. Not so we can just go away and be gone forever. We're waiting for him to come and establish that kingdom that Daniel foresaw. We're waiting for him to come and to take hold of this inheritance. The, the, the righteous shall inherit the land. The righteous shall inherit the earth. For, and be uh, living there forever. I, I like this. So then we find this picture then. God will dwell with men as he did in Eden. Wasn't that God's plan from the beginning? God's plan was the creation of, of humankind. And his plan was that he would have fellowship, very special, wonderful fellowship with his creation. So remember that God visited with Adam and Eve in the garden. And, uh, that, and, and keep in mind that man then was made for the earth. Uh, might say man was made from the earth and for the earth. The plan of God was that man would rule over the earth. And did all, he would have dominion over everything. Remember in Genesis 1.28 and so on? And it, he's gonna, you're going to have dominion over all the, the birds of the air and the, the, all of these different things. All the beasts of the field and so on. Well, that was God's plan. I really believe now that God's plan will be ultimately fulfilled or completed when Jesus does come again, the one we're waiting on. He's going to come and he's going to establish that kingdom that Daniel saw as a great rock that came to fill the whole earth and supplanted, really destroyed every other kingdom. Now the kingdom of God is established. So that's the fulfillment of what God really had in mind before Adam messed up. I got us into all this trouble. Now we got all these problems in this earth and, and sin is rampant and death reigns still. Uh, so, but it's Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who is the second Adam, who will fulfill what the first Adam failed to fulfill. Adam was to be ruler over this earth with his descendants. It hadn't worked out so great. But when Christ comes, he was the second Adam. And when he comes, he will establish this kingdom and he and his people will rule upon the earth. The book of the Revelation says rule upon the earth for a thousand years. And then I think that's not the end of it a thousand years. I think once the earth is set in order, it will continue. So anyway, we have then Jesus and his people fulfilling what Adam messed up, unfortunately. Uh, then in Revelation 21 and 1, we see this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So this is really interesting. This is Revelation 21 and the wrap-up of everything, right? But I would suggest this, and you can think your way through this for yourself, what you might think. But I think perhaps we're not necessarily talking about an entirely different earth, so to speak. Or a different, I think maybe we're talking about perhaps a renewed earth. This, the renewed heaven and earth here. And I'll just give you some thoughts about that maybe would take us that direction. We know we're going to be on the earth. Okay. Uh, I don't think that's a necessarily a different planet or something. I think it's probably this planet, but made right, made, made new. Second Peter 3 and verse 6, Peter says through which the world of that time was deluged with water and it perished. Now, here's what I want you to notice about this. He's talking about, obviously, the time of Noah. Men and women had waxed so wicked. It was very, very bad. God decided, wait a minute, I'm wiping this out and we're starting over. Well, actually then, that world that existed then perished. But... Wait a minute. It wasn't another planet after the flood. It was the same planet, but one that now had been cleansed, if you will. One that had been cleansed of unrighteousness. And we got a fresh start. 
God did with Noah and uh, with his descendants. So that's an interesting thought. The world that then was, uh, it was deluged with water and it perished. Well, the, the, the world here is not globe necessarily. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, the cosmos in Greek, the term is cosmos, the cosmos, the order of things, the system of things. That's what was wicked. The people were wicked. That's what had to be cleansed, washed out. So uh, uh, in verse seven, he goes on to say, but by the same word, the word of God, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the godless. So I don't know. There may, maybe there's a parallel here. Uh, I'm not sure I necessarily feel like I understand all the details of this. Paul, remember in 1 Corinthians 13, said, you know, right now we're looking through a glass darkly. Uh, looking into the kingdom of God in the future. So if Paul was sort of looking through a glass darkly, as it were, into a mirror darkly, then I think probably Dan is still pretty trying to kind of sort it out to understand it. It'll all be there. It'll all be wonderful and it'll all work. But by Peter saying, you know, this new deal is going to be like it was with the flood. The world that then was, the cosmos, the orderly arrangement of things, was just destroyed. It didn't exist anymore. And we started over. Well, somehow I think that's what he's comparing to the time that will come and the judgment that will come. And he speaks of fire. So I don't know how that would work exactly. But the unrighteous earth, one way or another, whether this is literal or to be understood in a non-literal sense, I don't know. But either way, I do know that it's the unrighteousness that will be ultimately destroyed. And it will be righteous people who will populate the earth afterwards. And this time it'll be better than Noah. It's going to be Christ, the Messiah, the true human son of God that will actually lead that, that cosmos in, in that day, in that time to come. So, uh, and then we come to this that I was mentioning where the, the bottom line is then, See, the home of God is among mortals. It's not that mortals go off to be with God exactly at that point, but God comes and he dwells with us poor human beings again. This is an interesting thing. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. So I think that the, ultimately what we're seeing here is Eden... And what God set out to do in the Garden of Eden, being reestablished, it's being reset. So we, we've talked about our inheritance. The righteous will inherit the land. The righteous will inherit the earth. That's, that's tremendous. But we're also seeing that that inheritance, they will dwell in that land forever. Okay. But Christ will come. He's the one that's going to get all this sorted out and established. He's going to come back to where? Back to earth. And then he will rule. And then his people will rule with him. But I think, and the thousand years is sort of like a transition time in which people are coming to, to put this earth, this world in order. And at the end of that, God himself will be able to visit with man again, even as he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. That's the objective, I think. So here we say God himself will be with them. This is tremendous. Okay. I like this in Revelation then 21 and verse 5. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. But I, I'm making this uh, note. He doesn't say he makes all new things. It's, he's making all things new. He, he, and so that's why I'm saying perhaps it is more of a renewing that we'll see out there. So when we get to this, if you say, well, I think he's going to make a whole new planet, a whole new earth. Well, that's OK with me. If that's if that's what he does, it'll be OK. I just know we're going to be on the earth with Christ and that's our inheritance. But I think perhaps it's actually this beautiful earth. We love it to this day. We go out. There's nothing wrong with the mountains and the and this beautiful uh, uh, waterfalls and all these seas and these beautiful things. 
It's a great planet here. We like it a lot. We were made from this planet and for this planet to rule it. And so I think uh, uh, perhaps it's this planet itself that will be made new. And then we have a new planet, but it's actually something that was made new from, from something that God had already originally made. Remember when God made everything, he said he saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. He declared it good. So all of this is, a, this is great. The problem has not been the planet. The problem has been the evil in, the, in this place, in this planet. And that's what I think will be having to be destroyed. And uh, so he makes all things new. And then I like back to uh, uh, what we had uh, Bill Schlegel was mentioning uh, in Acts 3. Well, we read it too, where Peter has said, there's a coming of future restoration of all things. It's not a destruction of all things exactly, a restoration of all things. So you think about that too. Uh, so I think that's uh, very significant. So I'm just suggesting here, why destroy a perfectly good planet? As you can see, I'm leaning toward a new earth and renewed earth. And, uh, uh, and also, by the way, if we believe that, then maybe this is a helpful argument to our millennial friends and others who are concerned about the, uh, our stewardship of the planet, taking care of God's earth, as it were, uh, which I agree we haven't always done such a good job of. But uh, the, the worst thing about it, though, is not the litter we leave on the streets. The worst thing is the sin that we have in our societies, the, the evil. That's what God can't bear with. The other we could clean up, that's okay. But it's gonna take something to straighten out the, the evil that's been in society and in our world in that sense. So stewardship, thought we might appeal to a new generation of people who are concerned about the planet by saying, yeah, we believe we ought to take care of it. This is our home. One way or another, it, it may be totally reworked somehow as God brings this all together. But whatever the case, I believe the planet that we're on is the planet that we're from. God made us from the earth and he made us for the earth. So I think that's, uh, I think maybe I got it. So our expectation then is this. Peter says, we're reading from Peter a lot on this, aren't we? Peter says, but in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and new earth Okay, whatever it is, whether it's new, renewed earth, renewed heavens, or whether it's a all new business. Either way, the key is where righteousness will be at home, where righteousness is at home. I, I love that. Pastor Mark has mentioned that uh, phrase and brought it to our attention at different times. And I, I'm always impressed with that. It's going to be a place where righteousness will be at home. God is a righteous God. His kingdom will be a kingdom of righteousness with people who love God and love his righteousness. No wonder Jesus said uh, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You got it. Because that's what this future kingdom is all about. It's what our future is about. It's what our eternal life is about. A life of righteousness. And... Uh, so this is going to be a place where righteousness will be at home. And that is not now. But I think we can say, you know, we, we see righteousness in the earth, in God's people, in the work of God. We see good things in many ways. But there is so much evil in this world. Uh, this isn't that time yet when righteousness is the rule of the day. When righteousness is, uh, is at home, if you will in that. Okay. So then maybe we uh, will think about, uh, I think uh, perhaps the next time we take this subject up, maybe next week, next Sunday, we'll talk about Jesus and the kingdom of God. We'll kind of look at it from that perspective a little more. But this one thing we know Jesus said, and I think it still works for us. He's saying to his disciples, pray your kingdom come, thy kingdom come, the kingdom of God. It wasn't already present, not in that sense, but it's to come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the will of God is being done in, in heaven when the kingdom of God is established here on the earth. 
then the will of God will be done. Righteousness will be at home. What do you think? Is that good or what?